when Richard Blanco read the inaugural poem he wrote for President Obama's second swearing in, it was like he was reading a love letter to the United States and to the people who call it home. One sun rose on us today, kindled over our shores, peeking over the Smokies, greeting the faces of the Great Lakes. One ground, our ground, rooting us to every stalk of corn, every head of wheat sown by sweat and hands, hands gleaning coal or planting windmills in deserts and hilltops that keep us warm. It's a message of unity and commonality that seems all the more necessary today, and it is a message that Blanco, the country's fifth inaugural poet and the youngest, first Latino, first immigrant, and first openly gay person in the role, continues in his latest book, How to Love a Country. He joined Jim Browdy earlier to talk about it. Richard Blanco joins me now. Richard, it's great to see you. Congratulations. The collection is fabulous. Great to be here. Thanks. You know that I first heard of you when you stood on that stage and read in 2013. When did you first hear that you had been chosen to do it? Almost uh, a, little, a little less, a little more than a month, actually. It was December 12th, 2012. So I had a little more than a month to write three poems for the inauguration. What was that like article. when you got that call, when you were um, I first I thought it was a joke. I mean, it's not something any poet sort of, you know, that you expect every four years to be called. It's not that like, like the Olympics. Um, and then I was actually uh, overcome by a real amazing sense of gratitude. Gratitude for my parents and my grandparents and all the decisions that they made, uh, their immigration, the things that they lost and sacrificed so that we, my brother and I, could have a better life from in Cuba. this country from and Cuba. And speaking of your parents, you took your mother. Not your partner, correct? You took your mother. I took my Is mother. Is that a bone of contention in the relationship or no? <laughs> no, I just, like I said, I think part of, part of that story is it starts with my mother and her decision to, to emigrate, to leave Cuba. And none of that really w would have been possible without her. Uh, she left her entire family behind in Cuba, made a lot of sacrifices. And so, What's the, line, the great line here you describe yourself? I think it's something like made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, yeah. imported to the <laughs> U.S., right? Import, so when that yeah, kid totally got it right. is standing up on the stage, <laughs> I mean, what does that feel like in your body? What is well, that like? You know, I wasn't as nervous as I thought I was going to be, only because there's this incredible sense of reverence and also, and also just this incredible sort of sense of finally having a place at the American table, growing up as, as a gay, uh, Latino, Cuban immigrant kid. Um, well, I wasn't sure that um, what it meant to be an American and that I, or that I belonged to that American narrative. So it was this wonderful moment of finally feeling, as I told my mother, I guess we are finally Americanos, right? Um, and, that, and that was just, just an amazing feeling, and not only for myself, but also for millions of people represent, that I represented indirectly or directly that probably felt like in the margins of what it meant to be an American, and I got to be that, that, that kid. Do you reread that poem? I read it this morning, one today. Do you ever reread it? I read it almost at every reading. Um, it's taken on a different life now. It's, it's more of a, sort of a, more of a manif manifesto or a reminder of some of our deals ver ideals versus what it was then at that, at it's that occasion. It's so powerful and so full of hope. What's, it's the end is something like, I shouldn't even do this, hope, <laughs> a new constellation, constellation. waiting for us to map it, to name it together. Yeah. I mean, it is so powerful. Yeah, it's it's it the idea just... of the democracy, that it's something we, we're still working on. Is your poetry different? from B.O., meaning before Obama and post-Obama. Is, is it different? <laughs> and certainly, I mean, that's what this new book is all about. It, it, it made me step into my shoes as more of a civic-minded poet, more of a poet of social conscience, and thinking about uh, how poetry can occupy public space, how poetry can speak to current events, how poetry can, can help us have different conversations about social political issues that are, have haunted us and continue to haunt us. Well, you know, you're going to read from it in a second. I hope I'm, I didn't get this wrong. As I said, you read it this weekend. The, the whole collection. And while you do address things from lynchings in the South to uh, the Pulse nightclub disaster to the immigration crisis, I really felt there was a thread of hope through. Is that, did I get it right? Yes, or? yes. I mean, one thing I didn't want to do is just write sort of a, you know, a one beat kind of book and, and sort of not just preach to the choir and not just sort of bang the same old drum. Um, I wanted the, the title, How to Love a Country, is both a question. It's a statement, and it's also a how-to book, a how -to book. <laughs> in a way, uh, to not let us lose uh, lose sight of those ideals and hopes, because then we have nothing left, right? Can you read uh, a poem? Sure. What'd I'd, you pick? I'd love to. Uh, this is my uh, my father in English, which is one of the more autobiographical poems, but still rooted in Great. the idea of identity and immigration. Great. My father in English. 
First half of his life lived in Spanish, the long syntax of Las Montañas that lined his village, the rhyme of sol with his soul, a Cuban alma that swayed with Las Palmas, the sharp rhythm of his machete cutting through caña, the syllables of his canarios that sung into la brisa of the island home. He left to spell out the second half of his life in English, in the vernacular of New York City's sleet, neon, and glass, and the brick factory where he learned to polish steel 12 hours a day. Enough to save enough to buy a used Spanish-English dictionary, he kept bedside like a Bible, studied 15 new words after his prayers each night, then practiced them on us the next day. Buenos dias, indeed, my family. Indeed, mas café. Have a good day today, indeed. And again in the evening. Gracias to my bella wife, indeed, for dinner. Insistes to homework? Indeed. La vida es indeed difícil. Indeed did indeed become his favorite word, which, like the rest of his new life, he never quite grasped. Overused and misused, often to my embarrassment, yet the word I most learned to love and know him through. Indeed, the exile who tried to master the language he chose to master him. Indeed, the husband who refused to say, I love you, in English, to my mother. Indeed, the man who died without true translation. Indeed, meaning in fact and efecto, meaning in reality, the hecho, meaning to say now what I've always meant to tell him in both languages. Thank you. Gracias for surrendering the past tense of your life so that I may conjugate myself here in the present of this country. In truth, así es, indeed. <laughs> Did you write this book for poetry readers? Or I learned a word from you in the years we've known each other. Metrophobe, which I thought meant Metrophobe. afraid of cities, but <laughs> yeah. it means afraid of poetry. Who'd you write this for? Well, that's always been in my sphere because as a, as a working class immigrant kid, I was denied poetry and sort of never was never, uh, or didn't have the same kind of access to poetry that I think I should. And, there, and, and that's part of what I try to do, not only with my work, but also my advocacy, because there are plenty of poets writing very accessible, wonderful work that really speaks to us today. And so, yes, I've always written in that vein. I've always written, as I like to say, uh, you know, I'm a working class poet. And, and certainly my work, I think, re hopefully reflects that. Uh, the greatest compliment that anybody can give me is if someone just off the street, uh, you know, just tells me, hey, I'd like that poem you write, you know, like that, that to me is really, in a sense, my, my audience, or I should say part of what, who I'm envisioning. I'm or that why. guy. Right. Right. I was a metrophobe till I met you. <laughs> Richard Blanco, the collection is spectacular. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, James. It's and been a congratulations. pleasure. Congratulations. Really Thanks. appreciate it. The book again is How to Love a Country. You can catch Richard Blanco in conversation with Jim Browdy and his radio co-host Marjorie Egan at the Boston Public Library tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. For more information, head to bpl.org.